In this video, we are going to be doing an overview of one of the most legendary battle mechs in the entirety of Battletech and Mech Warrior, as well as one that inside of the fictional world carries with it an incredible but horrifyingly nightmarish reputation. There are few mechs in this franchise that can stand as tall as this monster, and perhaps only two that could dare to approach its status in the technical readout displaying it. The Tome of a Bygone Era, TRO-2750, a titanic assault mech and one which is notorious for its brief stints of flight, followed by the boreal of its enemies. This mech is more than a simple battle mech, it is a terror. Today we are going to talk about StarCorp's immortal battle mech design, the Highlander. An assault mech weighing in at 90 tons, the Highlander's origins are perhaps humbler than its inevitable fame and infamy would display. When StarCorps first put together the concept for this vehicle, it was to create the ultimate urban defense mech. To achieve this, the designers decided to build the Highlander around several advanced pieces of technology, namely its advanced onboard Gauss rifle, its ferro fibers armor plating, and protective case technologies. Jump jets, what it became truly famous for, were added to the design at some point to help the Highlander negotiate its way through cities and their buildings, as well as other dense terrain features. The final result was a mech that could fight at all ranges, maneuver despite its slow speed, and was extremely heavily armored. Shortly after its acceptance, production, and development in 2592, the Highlander would, in battle, land an attack on a light mech known as a Death from Above. This strike is when the 90-ton battle mech leaps into the air and deliberately tries to land its immense frame on a target. Being the largest battle mech in history to jump up until this point, it was a terrifying sight for the enemy to see, especially when landing on a lighter target. When hitting one of these light mechs with this action, in fact, it was observed that the mech would half bury it into the ground, while crushing it into worthless scrap. And a term became coined, calling it a Highlander Burial. As if overnight, the battle mech would acquire the reputation around this, and it was embraced by the pilots, the SLDF, and Star Corps. This concept acted as a psychological weapon against the opponents of the SLDF and its mech warriors to start. It meant the pilots practiced this maneuver with vigor in order to master it, in hopes to use it themselves to break the will of their enemies. The SLDF itself saw the propaganda and psychological value behind this, and supported these training efforts. StarCorps realized the profits in the Death From Above properties prior to its release, and redesigned the mech's legs and armor plating to help it deal with the impact of landing these assaults during its design stage, trying to keep the mech in operation longer and trying to enhance its reputation among pilots with the SLDF, which worked as well as they imagined. While all of this unfolded, the Highlander would find itself assigned to every Star League army at the time. It was a boom for Star Corps' profits, to say the least. The HGN series itself would even break out of the mold of being a city or dense terrain defender, and would move into offensive operations as a mixed-fire support mech, particularly one that could be used to traverse difficult terrain and obstacle-rich environments. To call the Highlander a successful design for the SLDF seems like the ultimate understatement, and it would operate for almost 200 years inside of the Star League and its member state forces with a stellar reputation. So much so that it was the favorite among many royal units in the SLDF. This is a unit type I've mentioned in previous videos, and some may be wondering what exactly is a royal division or a royal regiment. Within the Star League Defense Forces, which are recruited from across the Inner Sphere, the elite designation Royal Formations were raised exclusively from the Terran Hegemony, and would often descend from pre-existing Hegemony Armed Forces units that became the bedrock of the SLDF on its formation. Though there are multiple of these, the one most everyone imagines is the most famous, namely the Royal Blackwatch. 
The Black Watch itself would be often associated with the Highlander battle mech, as well as their closest associated unit from after their dissolution and exodus, the Northwind Highlanders. The Black Watch would be forever connected with the last stand against the forces of Stefan Ameris during the coup on Terra, starting the Ameris Civil War. Most were killed before a battle could even take place, annihilated by a tactical nuclear device. It would be outside of the royal estate of the First Lord where the remnants would fight across Puget Sound in an attempt to stall for time to save the already dead Richard Cameron from his fate. In truth, knowingly or otherwise, these soldiers were fighting to survive in a war against the darkest of powers. Though some of these last warriors survived for years on Terra until the final liberation at the hands of Alexander Kerensky's SLDF and their return. It's interesting to add that Captain Elizabeth Hazen, the founding Khan of Clan Jade Falcon, was one of these last survivors of the Black Watch and during the final battles on Terra, piloted a Highlander. Because of this affiliation, in many ways the Highlander is still a mech one most thinks of whenever the elite of the elite is brought up in regards to the Star League Defense Forces and its royal divisions. While this connection may be exaggerated somewhat, it's more than fitting that these units would be associated with a battle mech as lethal as the Highlander. The original and primary configuration of this machine that would appear from 2592 during the Star League, and even somewhat during the Succession Wars, is the HGN-732 Highlander. This vehicle is more than just its weapons and armor values, of course, given the unique and special properties that it would display as a result of StarCorp's very impressive workmanship and design features. These properties would be in the overwhelming majority of HGN series going forward as well. The most notable of these qualities is associated with its most famous tactic, as named before, the death from above physical attack. To solidify this in-game, the Highlander has a quirk named Reinforced Legs, which provides it with a benefit when launching such attacks. Normally, when performing this role, both the target and the attacker suffer damage, with this quirk, however, the Highlander receives half of the normal damage it would normally receive to its legs while performing this role. The Highlander has more than just this to show for its traits, though, insofar that its advanced electronic systems on board also provide it with another quirk, namely the Command Battle Mech attribute. This is likely associated with its Hector 7 communications array, which is exceptional for its time. Less affiliated with this might also be its Starlight LX-1 targeting and tracking array. Either way, the Highlander is more than just an urban street brawler. It's often the tactical commander of an incursion or a defensive battle, making it a high-value target for many of its adversaries, should they be able to defeat this beast in combat, of course. Another property of the HGN series as a whole is its Cowl feature. The cowl provides the Highlander with three extra points of armor to the side and rear of the battle mech when taking shots to the head. While this may not save the Highlander from every strike on its most vulnerable location, it definitely does add durability to the design, and might just keep a pilot alive in case of receiving a ghastly blow to the head. All of these perks, though, do come at a cost, it would seem, as the Highlander is notoriously difficult to make a successful ejection from, so much so that it is shackled with the difficult ejection quirk, meaning that pilots must truly trust this machine with their lives to take it into battle, as there is a chance that escaping this mech in the most catastrophic of conditions may not be guaranteed. But who wants to live forever anyway? Looking at the HGN 732's primary attributes, we'll be starting by looking at its movement properties, beginning with its engine. Powered by a GM270 Fusion standard engine, the Highlander can achieve a maximum speed of 54 km per hour, or 5 movement points in the tabletop game. This is slow for most classes of battle mechs, though for assault vehicles like the Highlander weighing 90 tons, 54 kilometers per hour is acceptable as part of breakthrough and assault formations. 
To provide its legendary jumping ability, the Highlander has three Hildco Model 10 jump jets installed, giving it the thrust to leap up to 90 meters, or three hexes, in a single bound. This provides the Highlander with the ability to negotiate around buildings, hills, trees, rivers and other hindering water obstacles, as well as rough terrain. While this may not be a tremendous distance, it's enough to get the Highlander where it needs to go. It also means once engagements come in close, combined with its reinforced legs, if the Highlander needs to, it can perform a burial maneuver, and quickly can put an opponent that got cocky and too close into the ground. It almost goes without saying that this action does come with risks, and pilots must be skilled in handling their mech to safely and reliably perform this assault. Looking at the Highlander's heat management capabilities, things take a slight downturn. Early generation Star League models don't utilize the whole gambit or majority of their advanced technologies, and this battle mech, like many others, reflects that. Instead of using double heat sinks, the Highlander uses 12 standard heat sinks. While in theory this is bad, it actually isn't as impactful as one might imagine. At long range, even if the Highlander jumped and fired its two primary long range weapons, it will generate 10 points of heat. At close ranges, it does run hotter, but if it walked and fired all of its short range weapons, it will generate 12 points of heat. This doesn't make this heat system perfect, but it is affordable, and it is meant to allow the Highlander to either engage at close targets or engage at further ranges without much hassle. But unfortunately, it doesn't leave room for safe alpha strikes. Where the Highlander's fierce reputation outside of its devastating physical attacks comes from is of course the heat generating offensive systems it has on board. To start with, it is one of the earliest mechs to install what is one of the most devastating armaments in the history of Battletech, and a weapon that would arguably be the king of extended ranged burst damage until the arrival of the Clan ERPPC, which is of course the M7 Gauss Rifle found in its right arm. Every other system on board is really built to complement this device. At distance, it sends waves of scatter damaged missiles from its Holly 20 LRM launcher that is mounted in its left torso, looking to exploit damaged or exposed armor plating left by the 15 damage heavy shells of the Gauss rifle. If the target survives into close range, they'll quickly find themselves peppered once more, both by the rifle and by a Holly 6 SRM launcher mounted in its left arm, which will perform a very similar task to the LRM 20 but in up-close engagements. Finally, as the last close-in systems, it has a pair of Harman Star-Class medium lasers, which are inserted into its right torso. All of these other systems presume that the magnet shells fired by the Gauss rifle need support, and that it hasn't scored a lucky headshot decapitating its foe before needing to engage further. But this superb weapons package isn't without problems, and sadly, one centered on its primary system. That is, namely, the 732 only comes with a single ton of Gauss Rifle ammunition, meaning it only has 8 shots before it runs dry, and forcing the implication that every shot must count. This means that if there is a hard shot that may yield big results, the Highlander can't necessarily risk taking it. Strangely, it does have 2 tons of SRM ammunition, which one of those tons might have been better served being another ton of the very necessary and precious Gauss Rifle ammunition. All told though, the offensive power of its shooting weapons works well. The Gauss Rifle opens up armor and shreds vital systems in a single round. This is also backed up by its smaller form weapons at the desired engagement range, and can be done with a minimal amount of heat acquisition beyond its normal threshold. This weapons data culminates to the conclusion that the Highlander is a devastating long range support mech, a competent direct fire mech, and a decent close range assault mech, and this doesn't even go into its excellence in urban spaces and forests. The last component of the 732 to look at is its armored plating, which is the most sophisticated element of this 90 ton destroyer outside of the aforementioned Gauss rifle. It has 15.5 tons of ferro fibers armor, giving it an immense amount of defensive plating to eat through. 
to give perspective, one of its late SLDF peers, the 100-ton Atlas, has 19 tons of armor, which yields it 304 points of armor. The Highlander has 278 points of protection, putting it only 26 points beneath its skull-faced competitor. To add to this excellent protection, it also houses two case systems, one each side torso, in order to prevent its destruction from a single internal explosion. This means that the Highlander can live to fight another day, even if its hard outer shell is cracked. Perhaps there is a reason why it is called the Highlander, and not just invoking the Scottish people of the Highlands, but venerating the idea that it is perhaps built to be immortal. Though that isn't true, of course, it is almost impossible to take out in a quick series of attacks, barring decapitating the mech, something it is protected more thoroughly from as well, which to me is more than ironic. The HDN-732 made a name for itself subduing the enemies of the Star League, and over its nearly two centuries of service within the organization, it wasn't the only variant of this vaunted battle mech. Despite the 732 being the standard production model of the SLDF and later the houses during this age of prosperity, there would be another variant, built to the specifications of the royal units of the SLDF. The resulting configuration would be designated the HGN 732B, and would be an uncommon sight on the battlefield, but it would be the apex of what the SLDF could put together at the time. This was the harbinger of doom to the foes of the Camerons. Many of the warriors who fought in the royal divisions did so in a Highlander, in some of the most vicious fighting of the Ameris Civil War. In many of the cases, the Highlander they piloted would be a 732B, rather than the standard SLDF model. This configuration would use much of the same base as the Highlander, keeping its 270 fusion engine and its 15.5 tons of ferro fibrous armor, but would begin to diverge in other spaces. Namely, it would have 10 doubled heat sinks, giving it 20 sinking ability rather than the original 12, increasing the overall cost of the unit, but freeing up several vital tons for onboard changes. First, it increases its Gauss rifle ammunition to two tons, doubling the amount of munitions of the original and giving the HGN options when engaging at longer ranges. Next, it would install Artemis IV for both its SRM-6 and LRM-20, increasing the chances of missile impacts on successful hits with salvos. The final change is reducing its SRM ammunition by one ton and adding a third medium laser to the right torso. Some of the Royal variants are very extreme, but in the case of the Highlander, it's a refinement of what's already there, and the addition of a single technology to help expand its options when choosing what systems to utilize when engaging its targets of choice. With the death of the Star League though, the 732B would almost entirely depart from the Inner Sphere with the Exodus, and would be a footnote to the histories barring very, very limited Lost Tech finds in the Oasis that were once Star League bases, left to become a strange time capsule of a better age, at least technologically. The Amerith Civil War, First Succession War, and Second Succession War were exceedingly calamitous to the standing militaries across the Inner Sphere, but even more so to advanced industrial facilities, particularly those that were able to produce battle mechs and sophisticated weapons technologies, as well as naval yards. What was left behind was a dead husk. Though the Highlander would continue on in clan space in both its normal configuration and its royal variant, these were not present in the Inner Sphere truly in anything like a meaningful number after the First Succession War. With the destruction of Starcorp's facilities on Son Hoya during the Second Succession War, any chances of a significant revival of the mech in a meaningful form, even with a downgrade, seemed impossible. But where there is a will, there is a way. StarCorps would partner with Hollis Incorporated in order to contract it to deploy refit packages for still operational machines for dealing with the wear and tear that naturally occurs during normal operations. 
This would eventually see the erosion of the feral fibers on the battle mech, as well as the loss of the case systems and gauss rifle. Sometimes these changes would be incremental, other times they would be done all at once. If only because there was no ammunition left for the gauss rifle on board, or it couldn't afford to lose weight in certain spaces. This would go beyond simply refitting battle mechs eventually. Hollis operated within the Capellan Confederation, which by and large did not have the remaining industry to truly build their own assault mech chassis as of the end of the Second Succession Wars. What could happen though is destroyed Highlander chassis, even badly damaged ones, could be salvaged from various old battlefields or even new ones and be shipped to Hollis's facilities on Cori inside of the Confederation which could be rebuilt from the ground up into refurbished, like new Highlander downgrades. This resulted in sales predominantly to the assault mech starved CCAF, though exports were also at times able to find their way into other states, or favored mercenary units. It is noteworthy that by the end of the Fourth Succession War, Star Corps would have its own operations back in production on Son Hao and Cori and would begin the production of new assault mechs as of the 3030s, though both of these by this time would have fallen into the hands of the newly formed Federated Commonwealth. The HGN 733 is the primary refit provided as an official downgrade by Hollis and Star Corps, and is what would be leaving the facilities during the Third Succession War under the Capellan Confederation and post-Fourth Succession War under the Federated Commonwealth. The 733 mimics the original in a multitude of ways, but some of the finer details on board do in fact change. Its communications package is switched to the Hartfort Com A7 system, and its targeting and tracking electronics are switched over to the Hartford Hypertrack Q45 system. The downgrade would maintain most of its original physical features, as well as its GM270 engine and Hildco Model 10 jump jets, letting it keep the same mobility as its progenitor, allowing it to still be a vicious urban combatant, and giving it the power to still deliver its deadly Highlander burial. When it comes to heat management, the 733 actually sees itself expand on the original heatsink total of 12, letting it go up to 13, largely due to the increased heat of its substitute weapon for its now discarded Gauss rifle. Still, this means that the HGN 733, for a Succession Wars era design, is well cooled and able to fight at all of its optimal ranges with relative ease. This Succession Wars warrior changes very little from the original design, in fact, it maintains its Holly 20 LRM launcher and its Holly 6 SRM launcher. In addition to this, it still has two medium lasers, only they are changed in terms of their manufacture over to Martel medium lasers. The real change is the loss of the M7 Gauss rifle, which is changed out for a Mirrodon Class B heavy auto cannon, or AC-10. Now this does mean how it engages targets must change. At point blank range, its firepower becomes more reliable, as unlike the Gauss rifle, the AC-10 does not have a minimum range of any sort. While it can't deliver a single knockout blow like an AC-20 or Gauss rifle, and is a downgrade from the latter, it's still a consistent, reliable damage dealer, and one which still concentrates damage. What it does mean is that the Highlander's threat radius is somewhat reduced. But there is a benefit to all of these changes, making the HGN 733 almost more of a horizontal transition than a true downgrade from the original 732. That benefit is that the 733 becomes an endurance runner in terms of its onboard ammunition. Instead of housing 8 Gauss rifle rounds and 12 LRM rounds, the 733 commits entirely to keeping itself in the field in longer engagements or even multiple engagements by providing it with 20 AC-10 rounds, 18 LRM rounds, and maintains its impressive 30 turns of SRM fire. This quantity of ammunition may be a liability in terms of ammunition explosions to some degree, but it just means that the Highlander can keep fighting and fighting, so long as its pilots keep it from being too severely damaged. The last piece of the 733 puzzle is its defense. While it does lose its vital cases due to a lack of technology, it doesn't lose any armor, 
switching over to 17.5 tons of standard plating, making it almost point for point as durable as the Star League era counterpart, having 280 points in total. In essence, the HGN-733 hits almost as hard as its predecessor, and loses out only slightly on its main cannon, but gains an immense amount of endurance in regards to its ammunition-fed weapons. This assault can see long deployments as a result, and would have definitely been a boon to its sorely undergunned Capellan Masters, and later its Federated Commonwealth Masters. Consistently only able to be put a stop to by mechs such as an Atlas, or the much rarer King Crab. Inside of a city, or defending in dense terrain, a unit with a Highlander could potentially delay a superior force for hours or days over protracted engagements, unless the attacker was willing to sustain great losses. During this time, there would also be two other refits, though they amounted to mostly changing the main weapon and sorting around tonnage to make that possible, specifically the 733P and the 733C. The former mounted a PPC, the latter mounted an AC-20. A rare mech, with only approximately 12 being built per year under its manufacturers, each one of these would make the difference between if a world was taken or held during the Succession Wars. The Highlander would leave the Inner Sphere in great numbers to have joined the Star League Defense Forces on their exodus of the Inner Sphere. It would be a major component of the Royal Divisions and inevitably those who would make up the clans under Nicholas Kerensky. The man in question is the founder of the organization, the son of the legendary Alexander Kerensky, protector of the realm of the Star League and the man who brought Stefan Amaris to justice. It would almost be sardonic a Highlander, piloted by Con Carl Jorgensen of Clan Widowmaker, would be the end of Nicholas Kerensky. Clan Widowmaker was facing a trial of absorption by Clan Wolf, where Kerensky was presiding over the melee that would unfold as the former clan fought its trial of refusal against Clan Wolf's claim. In the midst of this, Call and his wolf rival, Con Jerome Winson, would do battle, one on one, in a trial of grievance with one another, opening up within the broader trial of refusal. When Call was knocked down during the fighting, the circle was broken and a multitude of fights broke out between the two clans. Walking into the melee in his atlas, Kerensky attempted to assert his authority, but a dazed Jorgensen, a man who truly idolized Kerensky, saw the foreboding presence of an atlas bearing down on his position and, with quick action at close range, blasted the atlas's head clean off its shoulders, killing the Ilkhan and founder of the clans. Though this was an accident, Jorgensen would be killed for this by shameful execution, and his clan would be almost entirely annihilated thereafter, with their legacy being absorbed into Clan Wolf. I bring this up because of its importance to the shaping of the world and events of Battletech, but also because the Highlander, in its early writing, appears to be a mech significant when standing against the type of tyranny that both Ameris and eventually Nicholas Kerensky represented. The clans would still honor this mech over time, despite its role in the death of their beloved founder, and continued its evolution into what would eventually become the Highlander 2C, a second line mech and a supremely dangerous one. But that's something to be covered on another day. In 3049, the clans would invade the Inner Sphere in order to subdue the Great Houses and recreate the Star League, which had died centuries earlier. The Inner Sphere itself had wallowed in its own petty wars and destruction for centuries, though the Hell Memory Core had been discovered over a decade prior to the invasion, allowing for a revitalization of much of the Inner Sphere. But it was slow, and it started just in time. This swift, Brutal invasion shattered borders and consumed worlds in war as planet after planet fell. The Oberon Confederation would be the clan's first victim, being overrun at breakneck speed before the assault plunged into the body of the Inner Sphere proper like a spear crashing into an unarmored chest. The Draconis Combine, the Lyran half of the Federated Commonwealth, and most tragically the Free Rosselhaig Republic, the most brutalized of the Inner Sphere powers from the attack, 
all bled and suffered immensely at the advanced weapons of the clans. What the defenders found was that their attackers were centuries ahead of them, and possessed mechs which were faster, more armored, and more heavily armed. Engagements rarely saw a stall, or a victory, on the side of the Inner Sphere, who were dismissed as little more than freebirths. Though the invasion would start to lose momentum as more and more stiff resistance was met, no one truly knew if the Inner Sphere could stop this assault until the intervention of the then-current rulers of Terra, Comstar. The legacy of the Star League truly had two children. One were those who left the Inner Sphere so long ago and became the clans. The other group, the other spawn of the Star League, were Comstar, an entity that governed Terra and acted as an impartial communications entity between the houses, but was also a fanatical religious order obsessed with technology. Much would change within Comstar over the centuries, and it would be they who would be the ones to confront the clans. In May of 3052, the clans would agree to a battle challenge for the fate of the Inner Sphere against this organization of free births, which they held with a mixture of contempt and pity. This would take place on a planet called Tukiid. On Tukiid, the clans would find themselves facing off against mechs much closer to their own technologically than the majority of their Inner Sphere victims so far, and warriors that were just as fanatical as themselves though in a much different way. On the field of battle, they would be greeted by familiar sights from their own history, including from the Highlander, which Comstar kept many examples of in storage, keeping it in its original, technologically enhanced form. These would prove themselves well on the battlefield against the SLDF's descendants, and inevitably Comstar would win on the surface of Tukiid, seeing the clans halted dead in their tracks. But the invasion was not yet over. During the invasion, two primary variants of the HGN would rise out of this. One would be the return of the HGN 732, which would see its rebirth due to new technology being applied to its downgrade model, restoring them to their original glory. Famed pilots such as Rhonda Snord would adopt this incredible design during this time. However, the other was a Comstar variant, built after the lessons of the grim horror of the Battle of Tukiid. The HGN 736 would be Comstar, and eventually the Word of Blake's newest Highlander variant, and one which used new advanced networking technology. Much like the other Highlanders listed so far, it's powered by a 270 Fusion standard engine, as well as having the jump capability of 90 meters. It also reflects very much of the old Royal variant in its heat sinks and weapons configurations, for the most part. To start with, it has 10 double heat sinks, letting it operate at a cool temperature without much of a problem. It also has the same armor as the original Highlander series as well, bolstered by ferrofibrous. It uses a Gauss rifle with two tons of ammunition. It installs Artemis IV to its LRM-20 and has two tons of ammunition. Where it differs is it uses an SRM-4 streak instead of an SRM-6 and has two medium lasers like the normal model rather than three medium lasers like the Royal. The reintroduction of cases is applied to the design as well, but the main difference can be found in its onboard computer system. It has an improved C3 computer installed on board. C3 systems work to allow mechs to help one another more easily share targeting information about targets, and are an advanced form of networking. Normally, there are slave units and a master unit that is coordinated among units that is deploying this technology. The more mechs involved with the network gives more opportunities to share information. The improved C3 system can do both tasks and can survive the loss of any member of its network and are much more difficult to interrupt. This technology was almost exclusively used by Comstar and its Comguards and the Word of Blake. To be clear, it does have limitations, such as that it has a hard limit of six network members, and is incompatible with more primitive versions of C3 technology. The Highlander possessing this technology allows it to be deployed with like-equipped units to better enhance its on-field presence, coordination, and fire. It may be an interdependent technology, 
but it enhances what the Highlander is deployed to the battlefield to do. Destroy its enemies. Comstar and the Word of Blake used the Highlander to its fullest potential, with the overall military doctrine that they had in mind. The Inner Sphere would change dramatically after the end of the clan invasion. Interestingly, much of the facilities that were once taken from the Capellans would be restored to them in 3057 under Sun Tzu Lao. The restoration of this once again made them the primary constructor of the Highlander, outside of the more limited facilities inside of what was the fracturing Federated Commonwealth. The Federated Commonwealth would shatter into its core components during this, leaving the Liren Alliance and eventually the Liren Commonwealth with some of the facilities on Son Hoya to continue the production of this war machine for their future use. It is noteworthy though that eventually the Lirans would actually lose control of this planet by the Dark Age. The Inner Sphere itself would be fractured once more with the Great Crusade launched by the Word of Blake, destroying immense amounts of material and infrastructure. In the aftermath of their vanquishing, the Republic of the Sphere would appear in the heart of the Inner Sphere as every state, house or clan spent decades recovering from the madness that had unfolded. As a new calamity hit the Inner Sphere in the form of Grey Monday, the disruption of all interstellar communication by ease through the HPG network, the entities that would deploy this beast would find themselves embroiled in conflict once more. Comstar would be demilitarized and slowly eroded, before fanatics called the Blessed Order emerged to regain the glory that had once been theirs. The Republic of the Sphere would destroy these last remnants, before nationalizing what was left of the once proud organization. The Highlanders, sadly, could not save Comstar from this fate. Though the Republic of the Sphere would see its doom partially from the Capellan Confederation, but more so from an assault of Clan Wolf and Jade Falcon on its very core. Of the last two producers of this battle mech remaining, both the Capellan Confederation and Liren Commonwealth deploy the latest variant of this veteran of almost 500 years of warfare in the Inner Sphere. Though the configuration is listed as being produced on Son Hoya, it is officially listed as being available to the Capellan Confederation as well and must be produced through some of their facilities on Cori or other worlds. This places this new, advanced model in the war zones of the embattled Lyran Commonwealth, as it desperately tries to hold itself together while several regions balkanize inside of the state, becoming havens for warlords, all while trying to stave off periphery vultures and clan Hell's horse. For the Capellan Confederation, this mech is more at the forefront of their engagement with the Duchy of Andurian, mercenaries, pirates, potentially their own ally, the Magistry of Canopus, sooner or later, and of course the ultimate confrontation with Clan Wolf, otherwise known as the New Star League, as Daoshan Lao consumes the remnants of the now defunct Republic on his path to what he believes is eternal glory. The Highlander acts as a shield for the Lyran Commonwealth in its time of need, and it is the sword of the Capellan Juggernaut as it prepares to plunge itself into the beating heart of this new false Starly, fighting the wolves as well as their puppets, the remnants of Clan Jade Falcon and the reconstituted Smoke Jaguars. The HGN-740 is the latest Inner Sphere production variant both of these giants use, and is an official product of Star Corps Industries, though it likely also contracts out to Hollis to some extent within the Capellan Confederation, though this is speculation based on mech availability lists for the Ilkhan era. One thing that never changes about the Highlander, as if it were immortal, is the 270 Fusion Standard Engine and Jump capabilities. Where things begin to change for this Dark Age newcomer, in many other respects, is its other systems. Maintaining double heat sinks, the 740 expands its capacity from 10 to 15, giving it a sinking capacity overall of 30. It also increases the weight of its onboard armor to 16 tons instead of 15.5, but downgrades its ferro fibers to light ferro fibers, giving it 271 points of armor instead of its prior 278 or 280 though this is a minimal loss of protection. 
It also possesses a Case 2 for its ammunition, a clear upgrade over the Case systems of old. The 740 is the most radical departure from the original design. This begins with a complete discarding of its primary cannon system, as it supports neither a Gauss rifle or an autocannon as its main right arm mounted weapon, but instead embraces an inner sphere ER PPC with a PPC capacitor. This generates an immense amount of heat and is the primary reason for the expansion of the 740's heat sink capacity, but it also does the same damage as its ancestor's Gauss rifle and is not ammunition dependent. This means that this particle cannon, when fired, can blow the head clean off a target, should it have a lucky roll, and unlike the PPCs of old, or Gauss rifle, it has no minimum range. Almost every other system on board, as is the Highlander's legacy, is in place to support the primary weapon. For long range support, it comes with the well-suited and timeless LRM-20 with Artemis IV, including two tons of ammunition. This provides support as described before, namely scattering damage to back up the holes punched by the PPC. Once things get in close, its traditional medium lasers are replaced with a pair of ER medium lasers, and its onboard SRM system is upgraded to a full SRM-6 streak. The latter system is a leap forward, helping the Highlander always stay on target, and means that if it misses a shot, it doesn't waste ammunition. But the final biggest change is an almost secretly devastating new form of weapon named an anti-mech pod. These weapons are mounted in its legs, two in each, and act as a single shot scatter damage cannon, firing out explosive fragments. As a single shot weapon they generate no heat, and their damage changes wildly, and is applied as though they were LBX scatter damage, depending on the range that they're shot at. The closer the target, the more likely they are to be shredded by these leg-based shotgun blasts, potentially ripping through vehicles and battle mechs as they get too close to this devastating war machine. The Highlander 740 is a new design for a new age of warfare, and is one built on the foundation of the solid ideas that the Star League embraced from the first time the Highlanders marched into their service. These Honor Guard battle mechs would shape what it means to be an assault mech in many ways, with mechs like the Atlas and Cyclops taking many cues from their overall weapons configuration seemingly. The 740 seeks to perfect what it is to be an Inner Sphere Highlander, by reshaping it around PPC technology over ballistics. Time will tell if this is the new path going forward for the Highlander, or simply a diversion on its evolutionary path. Seldom is there a mech with history as rich as the Highlanders. It was there in the Star League as one of the top performing battle mechs, and represented the most famous unit in the history of the League, the Black Watch. The Northwind Highlanders would also inherit the imagery of this mech as well. It's also connected to Snord's Irregulars, with the previously mentioned Rhonda Snord adopting this battle mech herself. It was fighting against the darkness that was Stefana Maris, its light dimmed in the Succession Wars, but truthfully was allowed to breathe life into parts of the Capellan Confederation's armed forces in the dying days of the Third and Fourth Succession Wars, perhaps saving them, even slightly, from their near-complete lack of assaults, barring rebuilt and reconfigured chargers and other salvaged war machines from abroad. It is a mech that struck down the most heinous monster perhaps Battletech has ever seen. It stood tall with the Calm Guard in their victory over the clans on Tukiat, and now it marches to save the Leering Commonwealth, and to bring the wrath of the Capellan Confederation onto the vile wolves and their servants. In Battletech, there are many assault mechs, including ones which jump, but there are almost none that can claim the scale of impact and accomplishment that the Highlander and its pilots can. This 90-ton machine is seemingly immortal. Despite those who design mechs which strive to match it or overtake it, inevitably we all know the truth of the futility of such an action. Because this is the Highlander. And there can be only one. It was a great honor to be able to cover this mech for all of you in this video, and I hope you all appreciate it. The Highlander is a more than iconic mech and it has made its mark on Battletech in every era. First, I would like to thank everyone who voted for this to get extended coverage in our community poll. 
Second, I would like to thank each and every YouTube member who supports this channel. Videos like this are possible with your support, so thank you again for helping make this possible. Finally, if you enjoyed this content, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel. There is more always to come.